Welcome to the Spirit and Truth Podcast with Lee M. Cummings. Today, Lee sits down with Joel Richardson to discuss the end times and his dedication to reaching the Islamic world. Thank you for joining us and enjoy this episode. Well, welcome to the Spirit and Truth Podcast. Uh, I am very excited today to have a friend of mine with us. Joel Richardson is a Bible teacher. He is also really uniquely involved in a lot of missions work in the Middle East primarily, and uh, he's an author and a Bible teacher, and I've really come to love a lot of his writings. His newest book is from Zion, or from, uh, let me get this right, from Sinai to Zion, and it is an incredible book. I think it's really part two of the first book, or one of the books that you wrote about the real Mount Sinai, which was really, really interesting. Then you build on it. And like a lot of uh, the books that Joel has been known uh, for, it deals with biblical eschatology and his study of the end times. And uh, he's been a teacher. He's become a friend. And we've had the privilege of having him here at Radiant for the last couple of days. Joel, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. No, it's it's my pleasure. It's great to be here. I uh, appreciate the introduction. I have... Um... I have to give you some props back. I have tremendous admiration from you for you, and uh, just getting to be here and see the whole Radiant Crew family. It's uh, it's really pretty awesome. Well, we're glad to have you here, and sorry I butchered your book title. Yeah, it's, right no, it's the, easy easy to do. Right Sinai Design, yeah. Uh, but we'll get to talking a little bit more about that here in a little bit because I read it last year. I think that's when I got it from you, and uh, I can say I've read a lot of. Books on eschatology and the return of Christ, I've never read one uh, quite like that particular book. And I really, in a few minutes, I want to have you take some time and really kind of break that down. But I want you to just introduce yourself a little bit to our audience. Some people may not know you. Maybe share a little bit about um, what you're doing, uh, your family, if you would like to, but then also how it is that you became a Bible teacher and an author on the subject of, of the last days and times eschatology. Yeah. It's just a huge accident. No, it's a great <laughs> anomaly. Uh, I think the Lord loves anomalies. No, so I, I, got, I came to the Lord, came to faith um, August 20th, 1991. So... Um, I'm just here at 31 years, a little past 31 years uh, in the Lord, and and shortly after coming to faith, I was South, South Shore, Massachusetts, um, sort of you know little little pothead, uh, 80s kid living in his divorced mother's basement, you know, just kind of a loser to be to be honest. But came to faith. I was going to church, and there was a missionary that came um, working with Wycliffe, and he was working in Kazakhstan among the poorest of the poor. And, you know, he just told stories about what he was doing, showed slides. But he laid out the whole concept of the 1040 window, the unreached peoples of the earth. And at the time, again, this was 1991, maybe 92, he said, of those that are unreached in the world, and generally missiologists refer to those that are unreached as those that have one or less uh, missionaries or Christians to every 400,000, I mean, in that range. Right. So your chances, if you're an unre- if you're among the unreached peoples, of hearing the gospel, of, of being born, living and dying without ever hearing an effective explanation, a witness, an invitation to follow Jesus is pretty significant. Right. So among all the unreached peoples of the earth, roughly at the time, half of them were Muslim. And at the time, we were, as the global Protestant missionary uh, we were sending less than half of 1% of our missionary force to the Muslim world. And I was saying, half of the unreached peoples of the world are Muslims, and we're not even sending 1%. We're sending less than half of 1%. And so the missionary did a real basic Pentecostal altar call. If you feel called to give your life to the Islamic world, I want you to come forward. And you know, it was not overwhelming, but I felt the call. And, you know, I said to the Lord, I knelt at the altar and I said, Lord, you know, you, you interjected and you saved me kind of out of the blue. I mean, I should be, at the very least, I should be in jail. <laughs> um, I should definitely be dead because I'm such a moron. I should be in hell right now. And if this is where you need people, 
I'm no one, I'm expendable, I'm going to give my life to the Islamic world. So that's really how it all started. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I started my five-year plan to get educated, right, this and right. that. Uh, moved to Kansas City. I was going to, at the time, it was called the Grace Training Center. Sam Storms was the president at the time. I go, Lord, I just, I want to get the spirit. You know, the, the podcast is called, it's, what is it, the word? Spirit this? and truth. Spirit and truth. Yeah. I said, Lord, I want, I want a solid education in the word, but I also want the Holy Spirit. So that's why I went to Kansas City. Sam Storms, in a lot oh, of ways, yeah, embodies He's one of that. my heroes. Love him. So, um, you know, I had my five-year plan, but then as life, uh, you know, I, I say life happened, so I met a very beautiful woman <laughs> named Amy, and um, you know we uh, dated for three months, got engaged, got married. Next thing you know, you know you're single one minute, you turn around, and you know, wah, 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 and you know what happened? And you know, babies are happening, and this and that. So um, I was supposed to be in Kansas City for two years. I've been there now almost thirty. <laughs> And um, extended stay. Yeah. Now I, I we we I started looking at uh, burial plots. Just kidding, but um, that's that's. For those of you who don't know, Joel has a really awesome East Coast dry sense of humor, so you'll pick up on that. Yeah. So, um, in any case, I, I this this call to Muslims it never left. Now I did spend, by the way, 1994. Um, I spent better part of that year. Uh, went over to Israel. I'm supposed to be there for a few weeks. So I thought this would be a good scouting trip to kind of dip my toes in the Middle East. Uh, ended up spending the better part of the year. Just young guy, backpacking around Israel, Egypt, Jordan. Um, that was that was a good little taste of the Middle right. East. But then met my wife, got married, and, you know, uh, she has kind of a lot of uh, medical issues that sort of, I'll say, blossomed quite a bit after we got married. And it just became clear that moving to the Middle East was not realistic. Uh, you know, again, I was just kind of a young, immature guy. So I just plugged into... Uh, working. Um, I was going to school, but um, actually started a painting company, uh, you know, just, just trying to pay the bills, raise kids, babies, and this sort of thing. But throughout this whole season, the late 90s, I was volunteering and just working with different ministries online, doing email correspondence, dialoguing with Muslims, uh, trying to share the gospel. But it usually boils down to, and if you know a lot of Muslims, it boils down to arguing arguing with Muslims. They, yeah. they love, if they can get a Christian, they feel very confident. They can win you to Islam. They're very evangelistic. Uh, and in so many ways, the, the latter part of the 90s after I got married, this was my seminary. You know, just yeah. years of this fighty Boston guy arguing with Muslims and studying and reading because, you know, not only am I a fighty Boston guy, the Bible says, study to show thyself a workman approved. And um, Muslims, you know, they're very, the, the guys that I was talking to were very educated, very intelligent. And so it required me to read a lot of, I'll say, seminary level right. theology, this and that. Then 9-11 happened. And for a lot of people, that changed everything. Suddenly people started recognizing the relevance of Islam on the world stage, spiritually and otherwise. So then in 2003, um, in the midst of all of my reading and so forth, just out of, uh, probably part of my own personal interest. I had a piece of property, a couple acres, so I'd be out there mowing the lawn a few hours. Every week, I used to listen to on my old um, Sony Discman. I would listen to CDs of... Throwback. Yeah. i listen to CDs of Mike Bickle teaching on the end times. Um, but then I would spend all my evenings arguing with Muslims. So I started reading, just out of my own interest, books written by Muslims on the end times. What do they believe about the end times? Ah, that's interesting. Found it really fascinating, and I quite literally read every single book that exists in English uh, on the subject by Muslim authors, by Christian authors, by academics, by popular authors. And I said, man, this is so fascinating because what Islam believes about the end times it's so similar to what the Bible teaches, but it's kind of this strange mirror image. Mm -hmm. It's this kind of weird parallel to where all of the biblical good guys become the Islamic bad guys and vice versa. So I wrote my first book. Um, it was called Antichrist, Islam's Awaited Messiah. It's been republished now, just called Islamic Antichrist. And it just turned out in the providence of God that here I was, this first-time author, writing about a, a very unique subject. I put the book online for free, threw it on Amazon. First year, I sold like 15,000 copies. Wow, that's, that's incredible. 
Yeah, unheard of. Especially for a first-time author. That's incredible. Yeah, it, it really... So I didn't expect that. But then, you know, the invitation started coming. I started getting an invitation to churches to talk about this. And it turns out that a stupid street kid from Boston um, is good at telling stories and talking. And, um, you know, I'm a halfway decent uh, teacher and speaker. So the in the midst of painting and so forth, the invitations really started rolling in. And my wife said, I really think you're supposed to start doing this. And so I did start speaking in churches and um, it was resonating. And then over the next few years, I wrote a handful of, I've written, I guess, seven or eight books now um, dealing with, with what the Bible says about the return of Jesus, the end times, these type of things. And uh, it really had, it's not something that I do, you know, as a job, it's something that I'm legitimately really deeply passionate yeah. about. Yes, loving Muslims, reaching Muslims. And really, I started out all of this, right? I was a missions guy. I was a right. gospel guy. Right. The end times, I'm known more for the end time stuff, or I think I am. Um, but really, at the foundation, I'm a missions guy. And um, yeah, so then... Um, I and guess. don't you think, uh, in regards to that, I think that's a natural progression. It should be, anyways, a natural progression, because we should never have theology that is separate or doesn't touch and motivate us in the direction of missions anyways, right. uh, whether it's our ecclesiology or even our eschatology. So I think you telling that story is a natural progression. I think it's a beautiful thing how God did that. He touched your heart first, which led you to a deeper study of Scripture and engagement with Muslims. Uh, and now he's using you to teach and really impact the body of Christ to really bring clarity to some of these things. That just, to me, just they're not distinct and separate things. They're just kind of a natural overflow of one another. It's powerful. Exactly. Yeah. It's all a, it's holistic. Yeah. Um, I, you know, even as an end time teacher, I get a little frustrated with some guys that I would say are prophecy teachers, and that's all they do is just sort of talk about just like weird enigmas and riddles and the end times and trivia, but there doesn't seem to be this application, this gospel application, and it, it can just become weird, spooky, yeah. end time trivia. And I'm not, I don't picking on anyone in particular, but it, it, it is a danger yeah. when you get into that segment of theology. Well, it can, it, it can actually appeal to the wrong side of us. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the reasons, and I want to get into this a little bit more in a few minutes. One of the reasons why you don't see you you don't see such a unified belief or emphasis on the return of the Lord within the church, especially the Western Church, to some degree, has to do with abuse that I think some leaders and Christians in the church have seen and put it under the title of escapism or, you know, you guys just want to kind of go over here and talk about your conspiracies and your mysteries. And we're over here trying to get the mission of Jesus done. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have this dichotomy in the church of people who are say, well, I'm a, I'm a missions person. And maybe they tend towards more amillennialism or even a triumphal uh, dominionist type of theology. And then you've got the Bible prophecy people over here are almost like, well, we're just waiting for Jesus to come. We've kind of given up hope. But in actuality, when you read the New Testament and you read Paul and really all of the, the, the epistles and the gospels and even the book of Acts, there was this apocalyptic sense of urgency about the return of Christ that actually stirred and motivated the church from the very beginning. And I think re returning and restoring to a proper understanding of the return of the Lord and building it around the right missional motivation can actually be, it can be a beautiful thing to the church. And I think that's one of the things I've appreciated about you and about your books that you've written and the teachings that you've done, whether they're online or uh, your YouTube channel, is that, that it really, it's not just, hey, this is really neat stuff. I've, I've discovered something nobody's seen, the secret key. Mm -hmm. But you're actually I, you're pointing the church back towards Jesus and to His mission. Yeah. Seems like that's really important to you. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm you know as, as you, you articulated it well, I'm convinced that the early church they turned the ancient world upside down like overnight, you know, in a generation. And I think a huge part of that, a big part of the driver, was that as you said, that urgency. They believed that Jesus was returning soon. They believed they had this mandate to complete the Great Commission. They had this urgency for holiness 
which a proper application of the end time message will, will give all of us. And that was one of the big drivers. I think it's one of the missing keys of the modern church today. Um, absolutely. You know, in, in fact, in pointing out, as you said, a lot of the victorious eschatology guys, um, you know, in fairness, particularly in the charismatic world, it's also worth mentioning that a significant percentage, a significant segment of those in the church that have been talking about the return of Jesus for the past, you know, I'm going to say 50 years, yeah. um, they're coming primarily from the pre-tribulational dispensationalist framework. Yeah, absolutely. It was as though that was the only crew that is talking about the end times, and, and part of that whole system of theology is the pre-tribulational rapture, right. which I think has been fairly at times criticized as the you know the 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 um, the dominionists or the postmillennialists they refer to it as abandonment eschatology. Right. We're all out of here in a hand. Um, the, the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. We're out of here anyway. Why polish the brass on a sinking ship? Why engage culture? Jesus is, you know, we can, yeah, almost from the 1980s, the uh, the stereotype was like, hey, we can pollute the rivers. Jesus is coming right. back to clean it up anyway. reasons why. Yeah. yeah. So it, I'm not a dispensationalist, though I am a premillennialist. I'm not a pre tribula I don't hold to the pre-tribulational rapture. I believe that we will stand and bear witness um, to the Jewish people and to the world during the tribulation, whether that's soon or a little ways off. You know, I don't know. I don't pretend to know. But I think that is, well, it's not I think. It was the eschatology of the early church. Right. And I think that's um, a much more balanced biblical approach that the church needs to recover. And as such, if if we're really trying to get to a place where we're walking, you know, a lot of people say, we need to get back to the book of Acts. Well, I would argue that we need to get to the book of Acts and beyond. Part of that recovery of what we've lost in the book of Acts is not just signs and wonders and prayer and missions, but it also is having a proper understanding about what the scripture has to say about the days preceding the return of the Lord, the end of the age, and also the age to come. And that is a subject that, for whatever reason, has either been neglected, skimmed over, either because of offense or because of ignorance. I mean, I can't tell you how many Christians, even pastors that I've talked to, who are like, yeah, I teach on every book of the Bible except the book of Revelation because, you know, maybe, maybe uh, you know, the first few chapters, but the rest of it just too difficult, mm -hmm. and uh, it's way over people's heads. But yet, the book of Revelation is the only book that says, blessed is he who reads it. Yeah. And obviously, there's a blessing that's attached to all the Bible, but there is a blessing in understanding how things are going to proceed that ready us and actually propel us, or hopefully propel us, uh, to live our lives really intentionally and on purpose. As you said this morning. You guys weren't uh, in our staff meeting, but he talked about the Maranatha cry, and I love that. Uh, can you just kind of describe what the Maranatha cry is and how that kind of fits into this and having a proper understanding of, of uh, eschatology and, and, uh, or the study of what's going to take place preceding the return of the Lord? Yeah. Yeah. So I essentially just gave a message saying the church today, we really, we have the hallelujah down. Praise the Lord. We've got that. We're great at it. Um, but the other primary cry or declaration of the early church was Maranatha. And it's an Aramaic word. Um, mar means Lord, and Atta is come. So it generally is understood to mean the Lord has come, the Lord is coming. So it's sort of a creedal statement, and it, that really encapsulates the gospel. Yes, he has come. He's come. He's made atonement. He came once with reference to sin but he's coming back to judge the living and the dead and to renew all things, to restore Eden. Um, as it says multiple times in the New Testament, the restoration of all things right. as was spoken of by the prophets. Um, but it's also a cry. It's a prayer, come Lord Jesus. And so I'm convinced that the church today, really one of its greatest missing declarations and, and one of the defining cries of the early church was Maranatha, and I believe the modern church needs to recover that. We need to recover yeah. the Maranatha cry, and I think the book of Revelation uh, says that that will be the case. Yeah, Revelation the Spirit 20, and the bride say, come. Come. That will define the church in that season before the return of Jesus, yeah. 
and it's it's grounding. I mean, it's not fringe weird. Like this is actually not just New Testament. This is Bible 101. And when you really lay it out, you go, oh, it's not all about the Antichrist, the tribulation, the mark of the beast, and all of those things. Right. Those things are relevant. The Lord wants us to understand those things. But those are just the signs that precede yeah. our, our hope, which is his return. Yeah, it's the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of the Antichrist or the end of the world. It really is zooming right in on the one who is right now enthroned and who is soon to return and establish the throne of David on the earth and reign and rule. I mean, that's it's such a beautiful picture that we so easily skim over or ignore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe in the days in which we're living it and the days preceding the return of the Lord, whether it's now or a hundred years or a thousand years, God's going to restore that to his church, not just on a doctrinal statement, but actually in our hearts. And it's not just going to be a Maranatha statement, but it's a Maranatha cry yeah. of our hearts. It's, that's powerful. Yeah. Well, listen, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to talk to Joel about his newest book from Sinai, <laughs> Sinai to Zion. Yeah. All right, we'll be right back. God is calling the church back to full-hearted devotion to Jesus. Part of that is to learn how to be a praying people. God is looking for those who will build him a resting place, just like in the days of David. What would it look like to invest your time and priority into prayer? Dive deeper in School of Prayer, a free online course from Lee M. Cummings. Learn more at leemcummings.com. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so, Joel, you have written a book from Sinai to Zion. It's it's a great title. It's hard to remember. I'm trying to get Zion ahead of there. But uh, I, I read it last year, and I have to say I've read a lot of books on eschatology, from systematic theology to John Wolverd to, you know, you name it. Uh, I have never read a book like that book that lays out the imagery of Jesus's return in the Old Testament, really throughout the whole Old Testament, that gives such a descriptive picture of what that event, the return of Messiah to the earth, is going to look like. It was captivating. I found myself many times kind of reading uh, statements that you made and tying scriptures together and thinking to myself, I have never seen that before. And I'm not saying that to blow smoke at you. I just... I read it and it was like, it really thrilled my heart and it excited me. It, it filled me with uh, great expectations for the return of the Lord. Give everybody a, just a, a quick description of of why you wrote this book, what inspired it, and then maybe give them a 30,000 foot view of why you use that title and what kind of the content from beginning to end is. So the Lord's had me on this really kind of crazy, unexpected journey the past several years where, you know, again, I work with the underground church in Iran, uh, but then I speak at all these prophecy conferences and people over the years have come up to me and shown me pictures of this mountain that's in Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's a few guys that sort of snuck into the country back in the 80s and they were talking about it, you know, doing the Christian circuit. And, uh, and then there was another couple that worked in the country, took a bunch of pictures, early 90s. And so a lot of people go, they go, have you seen these pictures? Do you think this could be the real Mount Sinai? And I'm like, I have no clue. You know, this is not my purview. It's not my specialty. But this weird thing happened every time, and it happened about three times, just randomly some stranger would come up. Hey, have you seen these pictures? I, again, I would say, I don't, I, I don't have an opinion on this. This prayer would just rise up in me, almost just like it was not me. And I would say, Lord, and again, Saudi Arabia was closed to the world. Unless you were worked in Saudi Arabia or, you know, U.S. military or something, you couldn't get in. There's no tourism right, pieces. Right. And I would say, Lord, I ask that you would get me in. I want to check this mountain out. And I ask that you would open up the underground church in Saudi Arabia to me. And it was, it was again, it was like a prayer that wasn't mine. And I had to say yes to it because I felt it rise up. And I would say, Lord, I don't know where this is coming from, but I ask that you would connect me. Give me the underground church in Saudi Arabia. And so about uh, a little over four and a half years ago, uh, another friend of mine that sits on another board that I work with sent me the pictures. And it was the fourth time. He goes, what do you think about this? I just came from there. I was like, wow. you were just there? Wow. 
he works at one of the oil companies. <clears throat> and I said, can you get me in? This was my first opportunity. And he immediately texted me back. He said, I can get you, you know, you bring your cameras, do some promotional photography, I can get you a visa. And I immediately just felt, you know, I'm not a real sensitive to the spirit guy. I just felt this heavy presence. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is, I felt the demonic resistance. Yeah. yeah. I said, we're touching something big here. And so I got in, got to check out um, this mountain, which I am now absolutely convinced is the real Mount Sinai. Uh, two and a half years ago, I actually ended up leading the first Christian tour group in history into the country. That's incredible. It was just one thing led to another. Uh, I've got now connections with the underground. Like we are, we have a vibrant connection with the underground church in Saudi Arabia. It's all coming together. But so during this whole season, as I was studying this thing, the archaeology, the history, I found myself parked in the book of Exodus. First time in my Christian walk that I really was parked there, gripped by it. And what I started seeing is the way that the apostles, the way that the prophets themselves view the Exodus as the foundation for the story of redemption throughout the entire Bible. Uh, a lot of Christians would think the biggest boom at the beginning of the Bible is creation, and that's big. But really, the way that the, the Bible's written from a literary and a, a literary redemptive perspective is it's the Exodus that is the foundation for everything. Yeah. And the return of Jesus itself is actually the language that's used in the New Testament is clearly drawn from and patterned after the Exodus. And so the return of Jesus is framed as the greater ultimate or second Exodus. Um, and so the more that I started looking at this, I started seeing it not just here or there in the prophets, but it permeates the Old Testament narrative. It's amazing. And so you have the very first foundational text is um, Deuteronomy 33, the blessing of Moses. It's the last words of Moses where he's using the language. It's, it's very Exodus language. It says, God comes from Sinai, the Holy One from Mount Paran. He dawns on us from Seir. So it's this picture of Yahweh, but in anthropomorphic form, marching from the south to the south of Israel, from the deserts of the Exodus, and he's shining like the sun, radiating over these tall mountains to the south. That's Mount Paran, Seir, Sinai. He's marching. It's his lightning or fire is shooting out of his hands. And you look at this and you go, either this is just, you know, over the top, um, you know, language. And this is what a lot of scholars right, will say. Right. They go, this is just over the top poetic hyperbole. Right. God didn't literally lead Israel during the Exodus on foot. And then you realize when you start looking at um, a lot of the other statements in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that Jesus, John, Peter, Paul, all, you know, the New Testament writers, when they talk about the return of Jesus... They're drawing from this foundational picture. And so you start seeing it everywhere. You see it in Habakkuk 3 and Psalm 68. You see it throughout Isaiah 63, where the majestic one is marching from the south, striding forward in the greatness of his strength, coming up through Edom and Basra, soaked in the blood of his enemies. And so you kind of put all these different passages together and you go, this was a very well understood narrative in the first century. Jesus and the apostles understood this and they applied it to the return of Jesus. So the story, the return of Jesus, it's not just he comes back from heaven, waves a magic wand, right. waves a sword or snaps his fingers. There is a procession. There is a royal procession from the South in many ways, like the greater Moses as he sets the prisoners of war free from the armies of the Antichrist, as he's setting the, the captives free, as he's, it says plagues go before him, pestilences after him, he's destroying the armies of the Antichrist, his enemies, as he proceeds with this glorious parade, if you will, like something out of Lord of the Rings, just magnificent, up to Mount Zion, making processions, singing the Psalms of Ascent. And, and when you look at this picture, it's amazing the degree to which suddenly all of these texts that never quite made sense, mm -hmm. they just fall into place and it opens up the Old Testament. And just like you, I was thrilled when I was writing it, of course, because it's opening up as I'm right, writing right. it. And, um, you know, I don't think, to be honest, I don't think I'll ever write anything as important as Sinai to Zion. Um, I'd like to think that I, I will, but it's. I think it will be 
really the masterpiece of well, my life. Well, because I think regardless of whether you are a premillennialist, amillennialist, almost everybody I, that I've ever talked to agreed that when Jesus returns, no, regardless of the timing of that, kind of the generally accepted kind of protocol of how that's going to go is he's going to return to the Mount of Olives. His feet are going to touch it. It's going to split in half. He'll walk down through the Kidron Valley, through the Eastern Gate. Uh, and that's kind of the return. That's how I've always seen it. And that, mm-hmm. you know, there's Old Testament scriptures, other prophets that they'll touch. Where does that come from in light of, you know, what you're talking about of, of going from, you know, Mount Sinai and that procession all the way up to Zion? Where does that imagery fit? Yeah. So, I mean, with any subject... Um, we can't build doctrine off of one passage or one verse. We need to consider the full counsel of Scripture on any matter. So the Scripture speaks abundantly of this march, of this procession. But you do have this one verse, which has thrown a lot of people off in Zechariah 12, which just says, in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. It says, and the Mount of Olives will split um, from the... Uh, from the east to west, and so the, half the mountain goes north, half goes right. south, and then many that are there flee. It says, "You will flee as in the days of um, Azel by the, you know." So, but here's the here's the point. First of all, <clears throat> Zechariah is one of the last of the prophets. He's a post-exilic prophet. Zechariah was familiar with all of these previous statements concerning the march. In fact, when you look at Zechariah nine. It says, then the Lord will appear over them, and he will march in the storm winds of the south. It's beautiful. But so when you get to Zechariah 12, well, what's it saying? So people, I think, wrongly look at this one passage, and they read that in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, and what they read is in that day his feet will land Land. on the Mount of Olives. It doesn't actually say that. That's how I've seen it in my mind's eye, for sure. But so I think what happens is he returns... Um, arguably, maybe to Egypt. Um, you know, he actually retraces the entirety of the Exodus. I think a good case can be made. I'm not dogmatic about mm-hmm. this. Um, that he does split the Red Sea again, just like Moses. That he marches up through the region of Sinai, through the deserts of the Exodus. But when he returns, now this is a little, this is a little speculative. But if you think about it, when Jesus, when the power of God was released to raise his body from the dead unto immortality. There was a mighty earthquake, right? Like the right. ground shook. Right. There was there was some type of physical power released. The rocks that shook, they weren't overwhelmed with emotion. Right? <laughs> right. There was something right. that shook the earth. And so you think about this when that same power is released, when he returns and millions of people are raised from the dead, the whole earth is going to shake. Yeah. I think that's when the Mount of Olives splits. But if you think about it, it they don't flee until after the mountain splits, if their savior has just returned, landed on the Mount of Olives, why are they fleeing? Right. So that's, if you, a, good, that's a great question. If you keep moving forward, it says, and then. So it's after they flee, it says, and then the Lord my God will come and all of his holy ones with him. So I don't think, I think the, the danger is reading Zechariah 12 and all of these statements in this rigidly chronological ordered way, as opposed to it just making a series of statements um, in light of the abundance of all of these other passages. I think when he returns, the, the mountain splits. Many of those that are in Israel at the time under the oppression, occupation mm-hmm. of the Antichrist flee, and then he comes back with them as part of this triumphal procession. I think that makes the most yeah. sense. Yeah, let me recommend, if you have not picked up that book from Sinai to Zion, uh, and you're at all interested in this, you need to, because he's just given a micro version of it, but it lays it all out so well, and uh, it's it's compelling reading. Uh, if you enjoy theology, you enjoy eschatology, you enjoy Old Testament biblical theology, you are going to love that book. Um, let me play off of that real quick and ask you, kind of pulling it into modern times, Joel, um, and I know you're probably asked this question. I'm asked this question a lot. Knowing what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse and knowing the Old Testament indicators pointing towards you know, the end of the age, what has the last couple of years been like for you, having been a student of 
eschatology and now kind of seeing the global birth pangs beginning to, in my opinion, begin to accelerate. What's that been like and, and where do you see us, if you have any opinion about that, kind of in the grand scheme of thing? A lot of people are trying to figure out, okay, where are we? What does this all mean? Is this the best of times or the worst of times? Or is it kind of a combination of both? Well, I think the end times will be both. Uh, you know, the scriptures are clear. There's going to be a great falling away. And I think we're seeing that. It's painful. But the scriptures are also clear in Joel chapter 2 that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Um, and it's in the context of just before the great and terrible day of the Lord. The sun goes dark, the moon turns to blood. So it's going to be a mighty global revival. At the same time, there is a great falling away. So I'm uh, I'm looking forward to the revival part of it. We're seeing this in the Middle East and different places, Iran, Afghanistan. We're seeing massive growth right now in Saudi Arabia, of all places. Yeah. Um, but I'm looking for something far greater than what we're seeing right now. Um, so I'll say that. Now, with regard to prophecy, I think we need to be careful about getting too specific. But the way the language that I would use is to say, when you carefully study the the geopolitical landscape that the prophets describe at the end of the age, the contours of the geopolitical landscape at the end of the age, and then you look out at the world today, they're both coming into almost perfect agreement. And not in a very vague and general way, but in a pretty specific way. The, the, the notion that these prophets thousands of years ago were able to describe the geopolitical landscape that we see today, that's significant. Uh -huh. That's not a coincidence. And so I don't pretend to know all the specifics and ins and outs. If there's one thing I am confident of is that I'm going to get a lot of stuff wrong. Um, I'll bet my right arm on that. <laughs> but the general picture is clearly coming into focus. And there's a lot more that we could say about that, you know, just in terms of like geopolitical analysis. There's also gospel signs. Mm -hmm. When we see the trends in, in where the gospel is going globally, I think that that's pointing to yeah. the, the signs are being fulfilled. Yeah, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all ethnos or ethnic groups before the end. Yeah. So we see that. Global persecution of Christians is rising in a dramatic way, anti-Semitism, right. anti-Zionism. Um, and there's a lot of other things that we could talk about. There's, there's also um, subjective prophecies that have been given by different prophetic individuals in the body of Christ that are pretty profound. Um, you know, I don't pretend to know the timing, but just based on the totality of everything, um, I, I'm, I'm, I would be very, very surprised if I live out to my full life expectancy. I'm 50 right now. I would be very surprised if I didn't live to see the return of Jesus. I could be wrong, yeah, but I really feel, I feel pretty strongly about it. That's kind of a Selah moment, uh, you know, because sometimes you can talk theoretically about theology, doctrine, especially when it comes to the return of the Lord. And I know, I know you, and I, I know that as teachers, we're, we have to be very careful about what we say. Mm -hmm. So you, you wouldn't just bandy that about and say that type of thing. But to, uh, but to hear you say that, and there's a few others that I greatly respect that I've asked similar question. And across the board, I've heard very similar things. It's like, I, I can't be adamant, but I, I feel in my bones, and I suspect by what I see, that I very well might see the return of the Lord in my day. That that should just cause us to just really stop and ponder that reality, that we may be the generation that is going to see the the transition from this age into the age to come. And what what a privilege that would be. But if that's the case, everything that the Bible talks about of the approach of the end of the age and the birth pangs and the time of trouble and the geopolitical landscape tectonic plates really shifting in very dramatic and very accelerated ways. It's upon us. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the things that right now you as a Bible teacher, especially with this emphasis, knowing what you know, what are you paying attention to on a global scale? Not so much just the, the biblical theology of it, but on the geopolitical 
arena? What are the things that you're paying attention to that are that are kind of catching your attention? You know, I could probably go down a list of ten different things, but let me um, let me say one of the things when I wrote my first book uh, again, and I wrote it in two thousand three, two thousand four. We're coming up, you know, eighteen, nineteen years ago. In the book, by carefully just working through Ezekiel thirty eight, thirty nine, the Oracle of Gog Magog. Uh, a lot of people believe this is Russia. They believe it's some preliminary different end time bad guy other than the Antichrist. No, Ezekiel's just telling the same story that all the other prophets are telling. And it's not talking about Russia. It's talking about Turkey. Mm. Um, I don't have a time to you know hash that all out. Right. But I worked through it and I said, I said at the time, I said, you know, if you just look out, all political commentary at the time said Turkey is turning to the West. They're becoming much more European. They're becoming much more moderate. Um, American foreign policy said Turkey is the model. We want to replicate this moderate, Western-friendly um, form of Islamic government throughout the Islamic world. This is wonderful. And I said, there's nothing in the natural right now to see Turkey becoming more radical, to become more nationalist, to become more aggressive, imperialist. I said, but prophecy says that. So just based on the word of God alone, not based on any hunch that I have, I said, I expect to see Turkey turn in that direction. Hmm. Well, over the past 18 years, we've watched it yeah, unfold. Uh, Turkey's still a member of NATO, but they are, they've basically gone the way of Iran. I mean, they are turning to both Islamism and Turkish nationalism. I mean, we've seen them invade Iraq. They openly say, the president openly says, that the present borders of Turkey are not the legitimate borders of Turkey. Wow. I mean, you know, hmm. so this very aggressive uh, move in Turkey... Um, certainly watching Iran, um, there's you know pretty clear, uh, again, prophetic evidence that some of these nations would become more aggressive and ultimately join together in a sort of coalition, a last day's union. Um, again, watching the, the rise of irrational, unexplainable anti-Semitism, hatred of the Jewish people, irrational anti-Zionism. Um, this demonic lust to possess the promised land. But one interesting sign that I would, I would highlight that a lot of people wouldn't think of is Isaiah 60. So Isaiah 60 wow. is one of the most beautiful, glorious descriptions of the millennial age. Arise and shine. For your light has come. It's you know, to put yourself in the shoes of a Jew who's been waiting. Lord, you said that you're going to come and and restore the kingdom of Israel, but instead we've just had persecution for millennia. How long? And Isaiah says, it's come. Mm. The glory of the Lord will rise upon you. So it's describing this, and then it describes the Gentiles bringing their wealth up to Zion to rebuild the house of God. And it's a beautiful picture, very poetic. And then all of a sudden it says, multitudes of camels will cover your and land. dromedaries, yeah. You go, where are these camels coming from? <laughs> They're coming from the land of modern-day Saudi Arabia. It says Kedar, Nebaioth. It's naming the children of Ishmael, the children of Abraham, from the region of Saudi Arabia. And you go, wait a minute, Isaiah. You're trying to tell me that the day is coming, not 10, 20, 500, a multitude of worshipers. And it says, and they, their offerings will be acceptable on my holy altar. And so in a weird way to say, but is there a revival taking place in Saudi Arabia? Well, again, over the past now five years or so, we're connected. We've got workers in Saudi Arabia in the underground church. One of them um, just did a real comprehensive... Now, the numbers are still small. Right, it's actually right. less than a 1,000 national Saudis have come to faith. You've got less than a 1,000, but the numbers over the past couple of years are 60% growth per year. My goodness. If that's the case, then Saudi Arabia is presently the fastest growing church in the world by about three times. Wow. So little things like that. In the natural, I don't have faith for it. I don't have faith that Saudis are going to be pouring into the kingdom, but it's happening. Hmm. How did Isaiah know that uh, 20, what is it, almost you know, 2,800 years ago? Yeah. And so little things like that, they get me excited. Yeah, that's, that'll, that'll fire you up right there. I know you, you've had a lot of... Um, interaction and engagement with the underground church, both in Iran and even most currently Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, our poll out in Afghanistan, our military poll out, and even our diplomatic poll out 
that took place over a year ago now, obviously left a void. I heard at least that Afghanistan, at, at about the time of the pullout, was like the fastest growing church in the world. Iran was, Afghanistan began to surpass it. Sounds like Saudi is on the move as well. What's happening behind the, the scenes in Afghanistan? Can you can you give us a little kind of glimpse behind that? Because many people have been praying for Afghanistan. We hear little bits and pieces of it, but you probably have had much more uh, detail information about that. Yeah, it's it's been a very busy year. Um, so, for example, we have gotten out roughly 3,000 people the past year, and probably, I'm going to say, at least 80% of them were Christians. So in a country where you, I don't know the exact numbers, um, probably there were less than 50,000 believers in the whole country. Um, so when you're getting out thousands, and that's just our operation, other people have got many other Christians out, um, our count right now is there's probably about 4,000 that we have our sort of hands on in the country. And so, you know, many have left, many have fled, and I don't blame them, you know, those with small children, et cetera. Right. Um, to surrounding nations, some have come as refugees to Canada, the United States, et cetera. Um, but our folks working on the ground report that people are coming to faith mm. and still in a pretty dramatic way now. Um, the the Taliban are ethnically, the vast majority of the Taliban are Pashtun, okay, mm -hmm. ethnic Pashtuns. And so very few of them over the past, you know, couple decades have come to faith, very, very few. The majority of the people in Afghanistan that are believers are among the minority group, the Hazara. So they would look more like Genghis Khan, you're kind of Asian. Okay, yeah. But they're a persecuted minority. And so it's not surprising. Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, they're persecuted. So... The gospel is for the poor, for those that are poor in spirit, for those that are desperate, those that are hurting, they tend to respond to the gospel, but also because they speak Dari, which is a dialect of Farsi. And so what's interesting about that is that many of them that are coming to faith are coming to faith because they're being evangelized by the Iranian church. Mm -hmm. The Iranian church has actually become an evangelistic, Isn't that amazing? missionary sending church. And so, but here's what's neat is over the past year, we've actually started seeing a number of the Pashtuns coming in. Wow. Um, and so this That's is... That's unheard of. Yeah, unheard of. I mean, among like Taliban members getting saved or those that were not Taliban members. Um, but so there's something changing. The church is growing, again, because of the chaos. We don't have real mm -hmm. careful numbers, but just based on anecdotally, our people on the ground are saying people are coming to faith. And the reason, quite frankly, is because where despair is the greatest, where people are the most desperate, the most hurting... Uh, that's where the Lord shows yeah. up in the most powerful way. I think you were you had a part to play in that uh, two part docu series called uh, "Sheep Among Wolves" that highlighted a lot of what God has been doing in the Middle East, especially in Iran. Um, you have a curious position in that you're an American and a Bible teacher who also has deep ties and communication into what God is doing amongst the persecuted underground church in primarily persecuted environments. And now we're beginning here in America to begin to see persecution on the rise. Culture is not necessarily, well, it's adamantly now becoming uh, separated and divergent from a Judeo-Christian worldview. So the church now in the West is beginning to experience a little bit and small detail, but a little bit of what our brothers and sisters in the Middle East have been experiencing in very intense ways. Mm -hmm. I'm curious of what you see as maybe the two or three primary lessons or uh, things that the, that the American church now, as we're beginning to experience it, can draw or should be paying attention to and drawing from our brothers and sisters in the Islamic world. Paying attention to because we're going to have to make some adjustments and some shifts as culture becomes more and more hostile towards the gospel. Yeah, there's a lot of lessons. You know, one of the things that I, a little story that I always tell is when I first went to go meet a bunch of the leaders of the Iranian underground church, uh, beforehand I had all these ideas in my head. I thought I was about to go meet the John the Baptist, the hardcore, yeah, the apostles right, of our right. time, super soldiers, you know, people that I could never live up to be like. Uh, and then I met them, and they were hilarious. 
They were goofy. They were silly. They were fun. Um, they were scared. They're regular people. And I go, these are the folks the Lord is using to strike terror into the heart of one of the most terrifying regimes in the world, the Iranian oh, regime. Wow. And they're just people. They're mothers and fathers and children. They have kids. And I said, wait a minute. They're just like me. Hmm. And what that means is if they can do it, then a screwball like me can do it. Wow. You know, a regular person like me yeah. can do it. Because sometimes I think when we envision them as, you know, whatever it be, the Chinese underground Christians or the Iranian, we think they're something like I could never be as an excuse to, you know, well, I'm just... And no, like these challenges come upon regular people, yeah. just like you and me. And so the, the, the thing of it is, is when faced with tremendous challenges, we can do it too. We can yeah. do it too. Um, another thing that I find is that when persecution comes, some of the biggest critics are actually Christians. They're ah, like, oh, that's interesting. quit whining. This isn't persecution. Right. Like, unless you're getting your head chopped off, it doesn't count. And I go, yeah, tell that to the guy who just had to move out of his house, sell his business, lose everything because of persecution, because right. some progressive politicians or this or that, or because you didn't bake a cake, because you stood to right. your convictions. Right. And their kids are severely depressed and maybe even suicidal because they're being bullied relentlessly at school. Tell me that's not persecution. Yeah, The pain is still real. And so what's interesting is that oftentimes when persecution comes, it doesn't come, it doesn't come and say, I hate you and I want to kill you because you're a Christian. It'll say, how dare you stand for... Like, I'm angry at you because I found out who you voted for. Mm -hmm. Like, they, they blame these peripheral things so that when you cry persecution and say, I'm being persecuted for righteousness, they go, no, you're not. You're being persecuted because you voted for a jerk. Right. And then you'll get Christians that will say, quit your whining. And so, they, so you know, persecuting cultures, they make excuses. They don't want to admit they're doing it simply because you believe in right. Jesus. They find all manner of other yeah, that's a good perspective. excuses and... Persecution is persecution. Pain is pain. You know, it's kind of like an adult that goes, oh, you know, you're 18, you just got your heart broken. Well, that's just puppy love. It doesn't count. No, that pain is real. <laughs> it's real. And when we experience the type of persecution, the preliminary early stages of persecution we are here in the West, it's still real. Yeah. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't diminish it and mock it and belittle it um, because, you know, it is sort of the, the frog in the kettle. Like, yeah. it's, it's here. It's coming. It's kind of like we're going right back to the beginning, uh, isn't it? I mean, who did Jesus pick? He didn't pick scholars. He picked fishermen yeah. and uh, average blue-collar, everyday people who had jobs. They weren't uh, the religious scribes. Uh, in fact, when a rich young ruler approaches them, he made the standard so high that he wasn't willing to do it. But he invites a fisherman who doesn't have a whole lot to lose, whose life's been... Uh, thrown off because he's encountered this this rabbi Jesus, and so he takes this ragtag group of a militia guy, you know, a zealot who wants to overthrow the government. He takes a corrupt tax agent and a couple fishermen, and he says, "Let's change the world." He, he, puts he, he takes some insurrection. He has got two, at least yeah. two insurrectionists, right? Yeah, yeah. So there you go. They're they're anti anti government. Uh, He's got a mess on his hands. Yeah. Well, here we are at the end of the age, and Jesus is in the Middle East taking Iranian everyday people in Afghanistan, and he, he'll do that here, and he puts a spirit on them, gives us the ability to endure persecution and to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and the hope that Maranatha cry in our hearts and uses us to change the world if we make ourselves available. Maybe that's where the intersection of missions, eschatology, and what Jesus is doing in the earth today all kind of intersect because that's how that's how this Jesus movement began mm -hmm. and it's how it's going to culminate at the return of the Lord. And I love that. I love the the idea that because we can we can idealize and say like when you yeah. told me, hey, I met these Iranian pastors. In my mind, I'm thinking these are, you know, these are John the Baptist. These are Apostle Pauls, and they probably are. Yeah. But they're also just real people with you know sense of humor and families and fears, and they don't know everything, and that gives me hope because here we are, and you don't have to qualify. 
in the ways that maybe you think you need to be qualified for Jesus to use you. You just have to be available mm-hmm. and to have your heart positioned with that cry that says, Lord, you came once. I know you're coming again. Use me to prepare and to reach people before you come. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's that's a good place for us to be, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was sitting in the back of the room, and I was admiring this room full of just beautiful, shining-faced believers. They're worshiping because in Iran they can't worship. And I, and I leaned over to this other American that had been had met them all previously, and I just commented on how beautiful it is. And he goes, "You know what's extra beautiful about this?" He said, five years ago, pretty much everyone in this room was either a complete drug addict, prostitute, suicidal." or a radical Muslim. And he goes, look at them now. And that's not to say that the Lord only uses former prostitutes hmm. and drug addicts and criminals and this type of thing. The Lord will use anyone that says yes, that has a humble heart. But it is, as you said, he, he chooses the foolish and the weak things of this world. Me, you know, just this former stupid pot dealer from <laughs> South Boston. Or, but he, he, you know, he, he'll use anyone that, that says yes to him. And the goal at the end of the age is to proclaim the good news. The restoration of all things is coming. The end of this tired, wicked, broken, corrupt system. And listen, you know, this whole system, it's groaning and it's tiresome, not just to Christians, to, you know, that 22-year-old kid that's wrestling with gender confusion that's a progressive, green-haired kid from Portland or, you know, whatever. He's groaning too. He's in touch with it. Everyone's aware of the fact yeah. that, you know, I think that, that um, uh, I shouldn't reference this, but it's a Moby song, um, Are You Lost in the World Like Me? And it keeps saying, the systems are broken. The yeah. system yeah. is broken. So when we proclaim the coming restoration, the new system that's coming, it's a message that resonates with everyone. Mm-hmm. And all the Lord needs is weak, broken people that say yes to proclaim that good message, to snatch as many out of the fire as possible, and I think, I think very shortly we're about to see that, that last great end time revival. It's going to be messy. It's going to be really messy. It always it's, is. It's going to be glorious. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to just say Maranatha. Amen. Come Maranatha. Lord Jesus. Joel, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's great yeah. to be on with you. Lee. God bless you and all that you're putting your hand to. Tell everybody where they can uh, follow you at social media, YouTube. Where do they find you? Yeah, so I've got a YouTube channel. I guess just type go on YouTube, type in Joel Richardson. My website is joelstrumpet.com, and I'm uh, usually informing and playing around and mouthing off a little bit on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> I think it's Joel7Richardson. There you go. Follow him everywhere, guys. All right, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time, guys. Thank you again for joining us. Stick with us, subscribe to the podcast, and we'll see you again right here on Spirit and Truth.